Good morning and welcome to our Facebook Live. January is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month and we have the pleasure to have Dr. Schroeder with us, gynecologic oncologist. Good morning, Dr. Schroeder. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. We know you're very busy and pleasure. so we appreciate you. And we have one of your patients with us, Erica. Thank you, Erica, for being here as well. It's so important to um, share your story, you know, and to help a lot of people. So thank you for being here. We appreciate you. So let's start with basics, Dr. Schroeder. What is cervical cancer? What causes cervical cancer? Cervical cancer is, is uh, cancer of the cervix. The cervix, for those that don't know, is the, the bottom part of the uterus. It's connected. Um, what they call the neck of the uterus, and uh, it's what stays closed uh, during most of the pregnancy and then dilates at the end. Uh, what causes cervical cancer in almost all cases is an infection and a persistent infection with the HPV or human papillomavirus. Um, most everyone will clear that virus if infected um, just with their immune system, but for some reason um, some strands of HPV stick around for longer and, and cause this problem. Uh, eventually can lead to cervical cancer. This is also what we're screening for when we, when we screen for cervical cancer. And so what are some of the stats uh, around the U.S., but perhaps specifically with our region in South Florida, what are some of the statistics? Yeah, the, the best statistics come each year for the whole country. So, you know, nationally there's expected just over 13,000 cases of cervical cancer to be diagnosed this coming year uh, with about 4,000 deaths, just a little over 4,000 deaths. Um, when they do heat maps to say where is cervical cancer most prevalent in the U.S., unfortunately, uh, Florida is always right at the top. Uh, we're actually the third uh, most number of cases in the United States, only behind California and Texas, and that's with 20, 20 million fewer uh, people uh, in Florida compared to California, and yet we're only a couple hundred behind in cervical cancer why, incidents. Why, why is that? What What's the cause of that? There's, there's probably a bunch of reasons. One, uh, so the other two leaders are both bigger states, but California and Texas. But something that we share, Florida, California, and Texas, is we have a, a large um, immigrant population. And so for a number of reasons um, around the world, cervical cancer screening hasn't become as, as well accepted as, as it is in the United States. I think, you know, if you take somebody just kind of in the middle. Right. <laughs> um, it's just it's just something ladies think they're supposed to do you know their moms did it their mom's moms did it and they're told oh you got to see the gynecologist that's not part of everybody's culture uh, then obviously there's there's difficulties to access if you're here uh, maybe not legally you you wouldn't seek care obviously right. um, and uh, sometimes a money thing right um, so for a number of reasons ladies don't seek out the care in, in those three states that they ought to and and, and then we end up with Right. Cervical cancers. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think it's really important to talk about the culture and the discussion, right? Which is part of why we're here today is just to be able to talk about it so people understand how important it is for early detection, right? Because we know that cervical cancer is one of the most treatable cancers, right? In the U.S.? Yeah, well, certainly a treat, a treatable is kind treatable of an interesting thing. and preventable. Thing. Preventable is, yeah. the, I think, the best way to look at it. Yeah. And, and we have two forms of prevention. There's primary prevention now with the HPV vaccine. Mm -hmm. So it's recommended that, that children get uh, between nine and 13 get vaccinated for HPV. And that's supposed to prevent them from getting the most prevalent and most high risk types of HPV. And so if you never get the virus, you're never gonna have cervical cancer. So that's what we call primary prevention. And that's not new, but, but more new than what secondary prevention, which is screening for and detecting pre-invasive disease and, and lesions uh, that we see on a pap smear that can be prevented and cured before they ever get to cervical cancer. You can read different estimates, but it, at least seven years between the time of an HPV persistent infection and the changes that happen to get to cervical cancer. Some quote even twice as long. So Erica, did you have a screening? Do you, is that how, what was your story like? Um, I just went to the gynecology and did my, my regular um, exams. And like your standard exam. Exactly, and start everything with the with the routine exam with the gynecology. And so, Dr. Schroeder, when we talk about risk factors, was there any risk factor in Erica's uh, background history? Is there anything yeah, that put her more at risk, in your opinion? So, so cervical cancer doesn't have a, a lot of kind of identifiable or modifiable risk factors, if you will. So, smoking is one. You, you don't smoke. Um, the other one is so. HPV, 
technically is a sexually transmitted disease, right. but not the way that we think about other and, and reportable sexually transmitted diseases in that most everybody at some point in their life will have it, where that's right. not true of, right. of some of the other ones or all the other ones really. And so you know, in one study there was 80% of college age women were infected with HPV at some point, but wow. almost 100% of them clear it as well. So it doesn't become a, a problem that even shows up. But we know that HPV is so prevalent in the population that if, if you're sexually active, mm -hmm. chances are at some point you're going to have that infection. And so I'm a breast cancer survivor, and I always wonder if having breast cancer will put me at a higher risk for getting cervical cancer. And I'm sure a lot of you out there have that question. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Is um, if you've had a cancer <clears throat> prior, does that put you at a higher risk? Yeah, there's, there's no link between breast cancer and cervical cancer that anybody's identified, either epidemiologically or, or genetically. Um, so, so you don't have to worry about that one. Um, there are genetic syndromes that increase your risk of both breast and ovarian, for instance, or breast and endometrial or uterine cancer, um, but there, there's no link. As far as we know, you know, to date, there's not really any genetic component, per se, to a cervical cancer. They're not inherited in families. It's, it's really almost entirely caused by HPV infection and then the persistence of the infection, which causes the, the cell and the DNA to undergo changes, which eventually lead to the cervical cancer. So is there any prevention? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Erica and I spoke to her and, you know, we were both diagnosed at 35 years old, pretty healthy lives. You mentioned Erica is not a smoker. I was not a smoker. Is there anything that people can do out there to prevent cervical cancer? Well, yeah, so it, it, difficult in Erica's case because the HPV vaccine came after she was the age that she would be vaccinated at typically. So originally the vaccine was recommended for between ages of 9 to 13. There nine is years old? Nine. Wow. Yeah. Just like you vaccinate your kids against measles, mumps, rubella. Wow. Or so nine years old. <laughs> vaccinate your kids against measles, mumps, and rubella. Wow. Um, yeah, and, and the thought process is this, is because it, it's known, whether you like it or not, that kids are having sex younger and younger in the United States and you know, around the world, but in the United States, um, you want to get the vaccine on board before they can be exposed to it. So this vaccine in particular is, is preventative. Once you have that infection, giving the vaccine doesn't, doesn't really help. Um, there is a catch-up, uh, and it's been recommended that you can give it between 13 and 26 for years. Um, the thought being there, maybe you didn't have the high-risk exposure yet, or that if you had one of the high risks, you still protected against others. And then recently the FDA approved uh, to, to vaccinate women all the way up to 45 with the same thought process. Um, that's not made it into you know, national guidelines yet, but I suspect it will with that FDA approval. So the thought process is you want to, the, the prevention is to get the vaccine before you become sexually active? Is that, a, is that what that, that's it comes down to? That's the best way to do it, yep. Okay. Okay. Nine is early, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> you, you vaccinate at six months. Right. right? Okay. So. And then, you know, then becomes a treatment question. And I've learned through my diagnosis that every woman has a different treatment plan. And so is the treatment plan for cervical cancer patients pretty standard? Um, maybe you can talk to us about Erica's treatment plan as compared to others. Or is it, was it, is it similar for everyone? What, what is the um, treatment plan like? I find cervical cancer to be one of the, it is standardized, but it's, it's very confusing to the patient. Okay. Um, Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So, so the first thing that happens is we have to decide what stage uh, we're dealing with. And that's done mostly clinically, traditionally only clinically. More recently, you can use some, some more imaging studies to say what is the stage of the disease. So just like in any other tumor site, one tends to be just the organ. So this tumor is just in the cervix. Two means it's gone a little outside the organ, in this case, either the vagina or what we call the parametria. Three, a little further. Four, widely metastatic, you know, further away. So that's how all, all tumors kind of work. The, the treatment for cervical cancer changes a lot between stage one and then two and up. And so, although every patient that you tell you have a cancer in your cervix, their first question is, when can we get this out of me? Right. Um, for stages two, three, and four, surgery is not recommended in cervical cancer. Really? So that right there becomes a very interesting conversation with patients. So luckily in Erica's case, she was a stage one, okay. and surgery is an option. But even then, the data is interesting in that you can treat it one of two ways. You can do surgery, like we did, and then based on pathologic factors that you find at the time of surgery, um, either provide adjuvant treatment, treatment afterwards, or not. Um, the other option is to skip surgery and to go right to what's called radiation or chemoradiation. 
And the oncologic outcome is, is similar in those two. That's been studied and looked at by, by the gynecologic oncology group and the radiation oncology group. So we know that you can go either way. And so then what determines whether you have surgery first and, and tailored, what we call tailored adjuvant treatment, or um, just radiation or chemo radiation? And, and one of the things is, is age and, and fitness for surgery. Obviously, she's very young and very fit for surgery. And then uh, sexual uh, preferences. Um, we know that chemo radiation up front um, tends to uh, decrease sexual function. You usually lose ovarian function. Right. And so some of the benefits of surgery up front, especially if you can uh, have pathology that says you don't need adjuvant treatment, is you don't have those things. The, the vagina will stay the same. You can protect the ovaries. I say that, and unfortunately for Erica, she did have the surgery, which we, we talked about for all those reasons. Um, the surgery went well, but her pathology was such that she needed adjuvant treatment. So she kind of got the, you know, the worst of both worlds in right. a way. Uh, in addition, even though we tried to save her ovaries and we did what's called uh, ovarian suspension and, and put them out of the way of the, the radiation field, because she's so, partly because she's so little, mm -hmm. the radiation uh, still was enough that got to her ovaries, that her ovaries did shut mm -hmm. down and she did become. Right. Menopausal. And so, Erica, talk to us a little bit about your recovery. So, you know, Dr. Shorter talked about the treatment, but then how was your recovery? Um, it was Were rough. you tired? Was it yeah, painful? It was, it what was really hard, the recovery. Um, right after the surgery to get the radiations and everything right. was like it. A little difficult because right. uh, I was trying to recover uh, from the surgery and and start to recover from the radiation. Right. It was uh, it was really hard. And did you work? Uh, at, did you? How yeah. long was your recovery process? A couple weeks. Uh, um, after the surgery it was two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. Two weeks and a half. And from the radiations, uh, I didn't have any any free. Uh, they my job. I, I work every day right. and I did it every day. It, like uh, I I tried I tried to do my my routine. Yes, which is good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that that makes me feel uh, better and and with uh, um, with energy. Right. So. And I know that they often say to keep a routine is always helpful for the recovery process. To just keep your routine and, and do what you need to do because mm -hmm. mentally I also feel that yeah. that allows you to to uh, not you know feel sad about what exactly. happened. And, so and I, I try to to do my routine in order to you know right. to think about and right. avoid all the 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 things that make me I make make me feel bad. Or of course. So. Good, and I know that the Miami Cancer Institute has a program called the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Program um, for Gynecologic Oncology. Is that something, a program that a lot of cancer institutes have around the country, or is it very specific to Miami Cancer Institute? No, no we certainly didn't invent it. Um, it's becoming more and more the standard uh, of care, um, not just in cancer surgery, but surgery in general uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, I, we are, I think, the first in town to, to in, in the area to be using it, uh, and we piloted that program starting uh, well, probably August 2016. We started working on it, and have done you know several hundred patients now. Before Erica, <laughs> <laughs> and are there some clinical trials um, that are happening at Miami Cancer Institute? When it comes to um, cervical cancer, some breakthrough. I know there's been a lot of breakthrough research. Yeah, we had a clinical trial open for um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, so immunotherapy, um, which is, again, activating the, the patient's immune system to mm -hmm. fight the tumor. Um, that's recently been closed, but we have some, some people who are long-term responders, and we're collecting that data, and it'll be presented you know, at a later date uh, as that data becomes more mature. There's... Um, also, because we have an alliance with Memorial Sloan Kettering, we're able right. to send um, cervical cancer tumors uh, up to Sloan Kettering, and they do a, a battery of tests on them called the MSK Impact, um, which looks at a, a lot of different um, kind of uh, genetic and protein markers that say, is, is there potentially something that would help uh, this patient in the future if they had a recurrence or, or, okay. or you know, down the line, not as a primary treatment. Um, so those are exciting. There's also been um, a recent study presented uh, at SGO about a, a, a treatment vaccine. So I spoke before about HPV vaccine to prevent ever getting the HPV infection. 
This is a vaccine given, again, to kind of pump up the patient's immune system against cervical cancer, so after they have it as, as a treatment, whether, either as an adjunct to chemotherapy and radiation or by itself. And there's been some promising results with that. So I think that in general and probably in, in most of our tumor sites, in the future we're gonna see a lot more of immunotherapy and kind of targeted therapy uh, as compared to you know, old, more, more tried and true uh, traditional uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. Okay, great. I wonder if the audience have any questions. Um, do you have any questions? I have a couple of personal questions that sure. I wanna ask, but I wanna hear from you guys. Um, what questions do you have for Erica? Uh, a cervical cancer survivor, and what questions do you have for Dr. Schroeder? Uh, looks like we have our first question. Dr. Schroeder, do you recommend any diet changes before and after? I don't. Uh, again, cervical cancer has not been shown to be caused by any kind of diet, helped or hurt. Uh, it, you can turn on the TV and, and listen to an infomercial or have a guest on Oprah tell you that you know, this juice works This for cancer right. in general. Honestly, I haven't seen any good science that says that's the case, and so I, I feel kind of awkward recommending anything. In general, I tell, you know, I tell Eric, I tell anybody, you eat a healthy, balanced diet. Right. That's probably best for your health besides cancer. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you feel good. I have patients every once in a while, they'll come in in tears. They were told they can't eat chocolate. I say, please, have a chocolate. There's, <laughs> there's, not, there's no science behind chocolate causing or increasing right. risk for cancer. And so... I think you have to be a little bit you know, reasonable with it and take some of what uh, the so-called experts say with a grain of salt. So eat healthy, but nutrition and yeah. diet and cervical cancer are not related. No. Okay. Um, okay, so I ha we have another question, which is the cultural stigmas, which is an important question because I, um, in doing the research for today, there's a lot of lopsided, and you touched upon it earlier, a lot of lopsided statistics, right? Um, cervical cancer is more prevalent in African American communities or more prevalent in South Florida because of the Caribbean and immigrant um, population. So uh, there's already such a big stigma around cancer. Uh, part of what I always think is important is the conversation so that we change the stigma around cancer. How do we... Um, present the information without creating another stigma, which is cervical cancer exists prevalently in a particular culture or in a particular um, uh, ethnicity. What can we do to change maybe the statistics so it's not so lopsided and at the same time not create a whole new stigma about cervical cancer or cancer in general? Yeah, I, I think the, the only way to do it really is education and, and right. conversation. I think this is helpful, and, mm -hmm. and I hope uh, some people watch it and, and hear it. Um, it's very interesting. Like, there is a stigma around cancer, the C word, right? People don't want to hear it in some cultures, in some right. age groups. Uh, you know, we'll have patients from time to time say, you can't tell mom she has cancer. Right. I said, I can't not tell mom she has cancer. I mean, I, I'm right. going to offer her chemotherapy and and radiation and surgery, it's, it wouldn't right. be right. You Some know, people don't even want to see the word. Right, we can kind of, you know, fudge the truth a little bit, but you right. can't, I mean, you have cancer. So, um, you know, my training was at, at Jackson Memorial Hospital and there's a huge indigent population there, obviously, and it was really interesting to see the differences. Again, I, I don't think, and, and uh, um, well, I know that it's not related to skin color or, or where you're from, as much as how, how you just go about your life. So the little Haiti population, for, for instance, very against seeing a gynecologist. It's not something they do. And, and when you talk to them about why not, there's some very interesting beliefs that I, I would say are not uh, scientifically based at all, but right. culturally based, but they're there. Right. And so if your mother never saw a gynecologist and told you that for some reason it's taboo, right. and you don't see a gynecologist, you're not you, going you, to be you're, diagnosed. You're not going to have a pap smear. Right? So you present with a more advanced stage disease. And actually, my good friend and, and one of the smartest people I know, uh, Kathy Brookfield, published a study in cancer from Florida, but, but a lot of the patients were from Jackson. And it showed that it wasn't race and it wasn't culture where you're from. It was your access to care. Right. Uh, when they do what's called a multivariate analysis, all the traditional things that you talk about fell out as meaning they didn't matter. It, it, the, the white person that didn't seek care did exactly the same as the non-Hispanic white, exactly the same as the African American. So when you look at the SEER data, which is, is what you're alluding to, where it says, you know, African American descent and, and um, non-Hispanic white or Hispanic non-white um, do the worst. It's true, but it's, it's because 
that's call. that's the one identifier they're using. Right. It turns out that more of those people aren't seeking access to care right. for umpteen reasons. It could be money, it could be status, it could be culture. Culture, it could right. be stigma, taboo. And so that's that's what you have to get around. I think the only way to do that is education. You have to take the young girl who's nine and thirteen, who's from Little Haiti, whose mom and grandma and grandma and great grandma don't believe in it, and say, But I should get vaccinated. Yeah. Mom. Right. That's so gonna that's, be tough, but we gotta get to it. Yeah. That's the Yeah. It's gonna be tough. But I think having these conversations are really important. Erica telling her story is really important. You know, sitting down, letting people know that early detection saves lives is critical. So for sure. I agree with you. We have another question and this one is for Erica. What support did you have during your treatment and after? Um actually I had uh, doctor support and he's a staff. Uh, they make me feel like a family, mm -hmm. and they involve me in, in, the, in my case. Actually, they always had all, um, answers to all my questions, and that make me feel uh, secure and, and, and safe. And actually, I had um, additional to that, the um, family support, so critical. my husband support. That helped me a lot. Without them, I maybe I couldn't make it. Yeah, that's so important, and that's a whole nother conversation about what happens to couples after a surgery like this. You know, it's again knowledge is power. Telling people what happens, letting people know what the treatment is going to be, what's going to happen to your body. Mm -hmm. That conversation is really, really important. So we have, we're getting there, Dr. Schroeder, but we got to continue um, changing the culture, changing the stigma. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Any other questions for Erica, Dr. Schroeder, or me? Last thoughts, Dr. Schroeder. Um, pap smear is the only way to detect cervical cancer? Uh, no. The, there's actually um, quite a bit of research now looking at also just testing for HPV. Okay. Um, pap smear takes uh, somebody trained in getting the sample to get the sample, mm -hmm. and then somebody trained, whether it be a computer or a group of cytopathologists, to look at the slides. And so there's a thought that we could better serve more women by just testing for HPV, which is testing for DNA, and you don't need a trained person to get exactly the cervix. Um, it can be detected, and you don't need anybody... Uh, any person to read it. There's no training in it. The computer says yay or nay. Right. And so that uh, may become the, the ultimate screening test down, down the road. Um, currently, the recommendation is still for cytology or pap smear um, with or without HPV testing in the U.S. Again, around the world, that, that, that's possibly changing because of uh, efficiencies and kind of, yeah, efficiencies. Okay. Um, Erica? What would you say to a woman that uh, is 35 or younger, because you were diagnosed at 35, mm -hmm. what would you recommend for a young woman that um, is questioning whether or not she should go see her gynecology? Um, actually, I recommend to go to the gynecology and the moment and at time. Uh, health is without health, you don't have anything. Yep. So um, I um, I recommend to go out to the doctor uh, to do uh, your tests and and this can happen to anyone. No, because you maybe you think that no, it's not gonna happen to me, but it happened. So um, I recommend to go to the doctor. Well, good, and and we're happy to see you, and we're happy to see how great you're Thank doing you. after your treatment. Um, to learn more, please visit the Miami Cancer Institute website at MiamiCancerInstitute.com. Um, and I hope to see you again on the next edition. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. And thank you so much, Erica.